So welcome to module four. Uh, here we're looking at ethical considerations dealing with condition and prognosis reports. Um, what are the ethical considerations, Sarah, when it comes oh, to this? Um, there are ethical considerations and the GMC have very helpfully produced guidance on um, in two documents, Good Medical Practice and Acting as an Expert Witness. So people should read those? Definitely, and they're very readable. I've read them, I could understand them. And, I'm and they're quite short, them. actually. They are, yeah. yeah. They're very straightforward documents. And uh, our experts can read those, and there's links on the site for that in the study. Um, so that might seem an obvious question. What is the role of the expert witness here? Well, it's to remain impartial. It is not that of doctor-patient. That is something the GMC emphasise. And it is really to provide the court with matters that fall within their expertise. Now, what happens if an expert doesn't comply with the GMC guidelines? What are the potential consequences there? Well, there are consequences, I'm afraid. Um, I'll just say the names of Professors Medal and Southall. If a report isn't up to scratch, then um, they can run themselves before the GMC. Now, of course, the, the GMC controls professional regulation. What happens if uh, the uh, expert is not up to registration? If there's a condition on the registration, or the condition on the registration. Um, something like that, then really they should consider that thoroughly before they accept instruction to do this type of report. So or the solicitor needs to know that up front. The solicitor front. really needs to know. And really, if you've got a condition on your registration, it could affect your credibility to act as an expert. And it wouldn't be very good if that were to come out for the first time in the witness box. No, of course that would be terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what is the guidance? that the GMC have produced, what's the essence of that? The essence of it is that the doctor is there to provide impartial advice to the court, to act honestly and truthfully, and um, to have integrity. <clears throat> um, so what does, what, what does the GMC guidelines actually say about impartiality? They just make it clear that the doctor must remain impartial at all sides. A good test for that is for the doctor to say to themselves once they've done the report, would I be happy for this report? If Would I have prepared the same report for the other side as I have for this one? And if you can say yes to that, then so, uh, chances are that it's an impartial report. So it doesn't matter who's paying you? No. A Zen monk? It shouldn't matter. Completely detached. Uh, so just in reality, what does that mean when, you, when the expert's examining the patient? They're just completely neutral, they're just taking the information down. And the yeah, I mean, obviously they are going to have to speak to the claimant, you can't act like a robot, but just keep a distance. This person isn't your patient, you're not there to treat them, you're not there to, um, well, you're there to make them feel at ease, but you don't need to be over informal. Just keep a professional distance between you and the claimant. Now, lawyers are often blamed for using technical language and... Uh, and of course, I hate to say it, but some medics use technical language. Uh, any advice to our experts about the level of language, the explanation of terms, etc., to assist the court? Yes, and this is a plea more than anything. Please, please keep medical language as basic as possible. Even if a judge or a solicitor has had a wealth of experience of medical negligence claims, the chances are that there'll still be some abbreviations they haven't come across before. So if um, language can be kept basic, if abbreviations can be kept to a minimum, and if possible, glossary of terms could have been included in the report, that would be so helpful for everyone. I think treat everyone like they're first year medical students or lower. And what about the use of diagrams, photographs, visual aids, etc.? That's very, very helpful, yes, if you can include that, but just please make sure everything's explained at a basic level. And of course it's the glossary must be correct. Yes. Um, and and so, it, just to be clear about this, actually in the report, do you use the technical term and then explain it, or do you refer to a glossary? What would be your advice It's there? really um, up to the expert what they feel most comfortable with. As long as the word is explained and it's explained clearly, then it's really what the expert feels most comfortable with. So I think the test really is, you're speaking to a non-medic. Yes. You're not speaking to a peer 
uh, at a medical conference or something. So it must be in a language that a, even a judge can understand. Yes. <laughs> um, now, the horror stories, you know, me as a solicitor and you as a solicitor, is when the expert changes their opinion. Any thoughts on that? Yes, experts do change the opinion. And uh, if that happens, please, please don't keep it to yourself. Just um, let the instructing solicitor know. There's actually a duty on the expert to let the instructing solicitor court an opposing party know. Now, it might be difficult for the expert to get in contact with the defendant or the court. So the best thing for them to do is get in contact with their instructing solicitor and they'll let the other side and the court know on their behalf. So the essence is communication. If yes. something comes up, you've changed your view, you must tell. Yes, I mean, it does happen. Sometimes it can't be avoided. Just tell who you need to tell. Are there any other factors that the expert needs to know about here? The expert just needs to bear in mind that they must always act honestly. They must be trustworthy. They must keep up to date with current literature. That's vital. And they must remember that their overriding duty through the whole of the legal process is to the court, not the person paying them. And any other ethical considerations during the course of preparing this report, particularly about patient safety? Yeah, again, I don't really think this is something that's going to be too much of a problem given the limited amount of time the claimant's going to be spending with the expert. But it, it should be at the um, back of most doctors' minds when they meet with someone. If there is a concern about patient safety, then the best thing that the expert can do is to contact either the GMC, their medical defence organisation, or another professional association, or possibly their instructing solicitor. So it's better to be safe than sorry, but go and seek advice from those organisations. So candour, transparency, yes. communication. Yes. Well, that's the end of these four modules. Is there anything else you want to say to our experts about these type of reports? No, just, just, just enjoy it. They are um, good reports to do. Use your medical knowledge and they're really, really helpful in the legal process. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. That's the end of the four modules. I hope you enjoyed the study material and good luck with the assessments. Thank you very much.